I'd like you to imagine with me this morning that an intelligent being, an alien, now this is an imagination. Do you have your imagination ready to go? All right, so you're imagining that an intelligent being, an alien from a foreign planet, descends in a spacecraft to Earth. Now before you write me off, don't let, let me go through the story, would you? Now his mission is to spend one year on Earth to learn everything about us possible. Now to accomplish this task, this alien is going to tour the globe. The purpose of his visit is to analyze Earth beings, to survey the state of life on planet Earth. What kind of quality of life do these Earth beings have? What brings them happiness? What brings them pleasure? Now he's going to have two guides that take him, and both of these guides are non-Christian guides. So they can only show him the secular part of life. He will visit no Christian churches. He'll visit no schools, no hospitals. The Bible and all Christian books and all radio broadcasts are deliberately withheld from him. All contact about Christianity and all data about Christian history would not be explained to this alien. What would he observe? What would he conclude from his observations? Well, he tours America. He tours Western Europe. He has absolutely no contact with any influence of Christianity. What does he see? He sees cultures in decline. He sees fragmented societies in which people pursue their own self-interest. He witnesses people saturating themselves with pleasure and entertainment while they ignore the needs of poverty around them. They fail to maintain good relationships. They seek deeper and deeper into immorality. He sees grand mansions in gated communities with inhabitants looking over massive slums dominated by hopelessness and poverty and squalor. He sees rising crime in our cities. He sees growing dishonesty in all strata of society. He sees rampant drug use and homicides in every city. He travels to Africa, and this alien tours countries where masses of people are starving and children are dying every day. He finds whole nations where young people are dying of AIDS. In the Middle East, he sees murderous repression of religions. He sees oppression and torture of women. But he sees cultures with this incredible oil youth, oil wealth that are spending it on themselves. In the Far East, he sees government tyranny, repression, and mass genocide. In India, he finds object poverty and hopelessness. He sees wars, small and great, costing the lives of uncountable people, devastating societies for generations to come. He sees repeated epidemics of disease spreading across confidence, continents, wiping out whole populations. This is what he sees. No doubt, this visiting an alien who's had no contact with Christianity gets on his spaceship and travels back to this far-realming imaginary world in space saying there is no hope for these earth beings. But there's one thing he has forgotten. He's forgotten that a divine heavenly being came to earth. Jesus Christ, who tabernacled in human flesh, who lived the life we should have lived, who died the death we should have died. There's one thing this, this imaginary alien never saw. He never saw the stone rolled away. He never heard the voice of the angel saying, Son, thy father calleth thee. He never saw the glorious hope of the resurrection. And it is the hope of the resurrection that brings hope to this planet. There is hope for our weary, war-torn planet. There is hope for a polluted, poverty-stricken planet. There is hope for this confused, chaotic planet. 
There is hope for this disaster-riddled, disease-plagued planet. There is hope for this shattered, suffering planet. Take your Bible, please, and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. 1 Peter chapter 1. Without Christ, his death and resurrection, there is no hope for this ball of mud that is spinning in space. But in Christ, through Christ, because of the living Christ and the resurrection of Christ, this world has hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, verse 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to what? What has he begotten us again to, everybody? What is that? A what? A living hope. Is it a dead hope? It's what kind of a hope? It's a living hope. Through, how has he begotten us to the living hope? What does it say in the text? through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. Now notice, Peter says, blessed be God the Father of Jesus Christ. He begets us to this living hope, how? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And he gives us an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, that's reserved in heaven. Christ has risen. And that makes all the difference. You see, if Christ did not rise from the dead, his death on the cross is pointless. What if the last scenes that we see of Christ are his broken, bruised, bloody body being taken off the cross. What if he was put in the tomb and the stone sealed the tomb and what if there were no resurrection? We might say then he was a good man. We might say he was a martyr dying for a good cause. We might say he was a good moral ethical leader. But if he doesn't rise from the dead, certainly not the son of God. You see, if Christ doesn't rise from the dead, we have absolutely no hope beyond the grave. If Christ didn't rise, life itself is meaningless. The grave simply is a long night without a morning. Now, this is the Apostle Paul's point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So take your Bible, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. This is Paul's point, that the resurrection is not a nice add-on after Christ dies on the cross. But the resurrection of Christ is a dynamic event that is life-changing for the believer if we fully understand it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 to 19. Without the coming of Christ, his death is pointless. So we start with verse 15. Yes, and we found ourselves false witnesses. What he's saying is this. Since Peter, James, and John all witnessed to the coming of Christ and his first coming and his death and resurrection, if he didn't rise, they're false witnesses. He goes on. Because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did, n whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. Some translations, King James says, in vain. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So if Christ has not risen, and there's, then there's no hope beyond the grave. And if there's no hope of eternal life, then we've followed a myth. And if we followed a myth, life is meaningless and life is miserable. But in the resurrection of Christ, death is defeated. Life has won. The grave cannot hold its victims forever. Christ is risen. This is the assurance that we too will rise one day. Now when Christ died that cruel, unjust, bloody, agonizing death on the cross, Satan and his evil angels rejoiced. When the nails were driven through his hands, angels laughed in glee. 
when the crown of thorns was jammed upon his head and blood ran down his face, evil angels rejoiced when strong-armed Roman muscular soldiers rolled the stone before the entrance of the tomb and sealed it with a Roman seal. Satan and his evil angels rejoiced. But when that stone was rolled away and Jesus bore, burst forth from the grave in heavenly splendor, all of Satan's hosts trembled. Fear gripped them. The Son of God could no longer be bound in a tomb. Christ was alive. Now, Ellen White, in the book Desire of Ages, page 182, describes what happened when Jesus was resurrected regarding Satan's attitude. It is a really a remarkable statement. She says, For as Jesus walked forth from his prison house, a majestic conqueror, Satan knew that after a season he must die and his kingdom pass unto him whose right it was. He lamented, that means he, he was sorrowful, and raged that notwithstanding all his efforts, Jesus had not been overcome, but had opened a way of salvation for man, and whosoever would might walk in it and be saved. So once Christ was resurrected from the dead, Satan at that point knew that he was defeated. Satan at that point knew that everything was lost. And he raged. He was just filled with anger because he knew now that there was no hope for him in the future. If you look at the four great religions of the world who are all based on some human personality, three of them have no hope of the, of, of the resurrection of their leaders at all. Just one does. Let me give you some examples. Judaism. Abraham, the father of Judaism, died about 1,900 years before Christ. But not one Old Testament writer claimed a resurrection for Abraham. Buddha, take Buddhism. Buddhism's incidentally on the rise in the world. Let me read to you from the earliest account of the history recorded about Buddha. It's talking about his death, and this directly comes from Buddhist writings. When he died, it was with that utter passing away in which nothing whatever remains behind. Buddha and Buddhists never have or never will have the idea of the resurrection of the Buddha. You take Islam. One of the interesting early texts on Islam talks about uh, Mohammed's death, and it says this. When Mohammed died, his followers were in denial. In other words, the early followers of, of Mohammed said, no, he didn't die, they were in denial. Then, when they learned of his death, this is what they said, and I'm quoting. Whoever worship Moham, worships Mohammed does so wrongly. He's dead, but God will never die. So, the, so Islam has no idea of a resurrection of Christ. I mean a resurrection of, of Mohammed. They don't have the idea of the resurrection like we do as Christians of the resurrection of Christ. Judaism, no concept of resurrection of, of Abraham. Buddhism, no concept of resurrection of Buddha. Islam, no concept of resurrection of Mohammed. But Christianity is different. The disciples went to the very city where Christ was crucified and they proclaimed, Jesus is risen. And the resurrection of Christ is in all four of the Gospels in a powerful sermon in Acts chapter 2. The apostle Peter proclaims Jesus is risen. This Jesus God raised up for which we are witnesses. 3,000 people, Jews, hearing the resurrection of Christ were baptized that day. Now Peter recounts the reality of the resurrection. So does Paul. Take your Bible here and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Tremendous chapter in the New Testament on the resurrection of Christ. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And uh, we're looking there at verses 3 to 8. 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. Paul is arguing here for the evidence for the resurrection. And he argues from the evidence of witnesses because he knows in the Old Testament it says that 
In the face of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. So he's arguing based on witnesses. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. He says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried in that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and by the twelve. So you see where Paul is arguing. He's arguing that the resurrection of Christ is a reality because the witnesses uh, in, of the New Testament era spoke about the reality of Christ's resurrection. We go to verse 6. After that, he was seen by over 500. Now, how can you say that the resurrection is a myth, uh, Paul is saying, because Peter, he, Peter saw him, the 12 apostles saw him, 500 people saw him at once. Verse 7, he was seen by James as well, and he was seen by all the apostles, and last of all, Paul says he was seen by me. So Paul uses this as evidence that Christ indeed has risen from the dead. Now here are three questions that confound the skeptics. Those who disbelieve in the resurrection today, those who are skeptical that Christ would ever and could ever raise from the dead. He, here are three questions that confound him. Why would the disciples return to Jerusalem and preach the resurrection of Christ if Christ was still in the tomb? You see, uh, all the authorities needed to do was take the 15-minute walk from Jerusalem to the tomb and roll away the stone and say, hey, there's his body. That's all they needed to do. If the body was still there, they would have ridiculed and mocked and laughed the disciples out of town. Why would the disciples go back to the very place where Christ was crucified if Christ, and preach the resurrection if Christ was still in the tomb? A second question, why would the disciples be willing to die for something they knew was a lie? If they themselves knew that the resurrection was a lie, why would you die for a lie? Why, if Christ had not risen, why give your life for a myth? Thirdly, if Christ had not risen, where was his body? See, all the Jewish leaders needed to do is very simple. The disciples go and proclaim that Christ has risen from the dead. To prove that he's not risen, it's very simple. All you have to do is produce his body. That's all. That's all you need to do. All you need to do is get the Roman soldiers and the Jewish authorities to go out and find the body of Christ. And that absolutely, conclusively demonstrates that he's not risen. But there was no body except a living, immortal body that Jesus appeared with. There's an interesting investigative reporter. His name is Frank Morrison. He was an investigative journalist. He was a skeptic. He, he didn't believe in Christianity. And he knew that the pillar that held up all Christianity was the resurrection of Christ. And so Frank Morrison said, if I can prove by my investigative journalism that Christ did not rise from the dead, if I can prove that, I have knocked out the pillar of Christianity and I can destroy the myth of Christianity. So he sets out to deprove, disprove the Christian faith by showing the resurrection of Christ to be a farce. But as he studies, he's absolutely convinced that Christ did rise from the dead. And he writes a book called Who Moved the Stone? And in that book, he takes a look at the characters, the people around the tomb of Christ. He looks at Mary and he shows convincingly from her attitude and behavior that she saw the empty tomb. He looks at Peter and he says, what would cause a man that denied Christ a few days before now to be so enthusiastic about him and go preaching about him? What, what would cause a man to do that? He asks the question about James, the brother of Jesus, who was not a committed follower of Christ initially, but how James witnesses for his faith 
is martyred for his faith. And he asks, what would have caused him to do that? He looks at Paul, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul, and he says, what would cause a man that's persecuting the Christians, that's dragging them out with threatenings and slaughter, as the Bible says, what would cause him to do that? And Frank Morrison says, the only logical answer to each of these questions is that each of these men had an encounter with the risen Lord, that Christ has risen, and the, right, the resurrection of Christ is a reality. Now, the question that needs then to be asked, if indeed the evidence for the resurrection of Christ, both as a basis for Christianity and the historical evidence of the resurrection of Christ, if, if that's all solid, what difference does it make? What difference does it make in your life and mine? What difference does it make in our attitudes? What difference does it make in our practical lifestyle? And there are two aspects of this to look at. First, the eternal significance of the resurrection. How the resurrection plays part in this larger concept of the great controversy. And second, how the resurrection impacts your life and mine on a Monday, a Tuesday, a Thursday, Friday, we better throw Wednesday in there too. Um, so let's look at those aspects. First, the eternal significance of the resurrection. The resurrection demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Son of God. If you were guessing how many times, it's quiz time, how many times in the Gospels do you think that Jesus says, if you destroy this body in three days, I'll raise it up. You know, I study the Bible for over 55 years, and I would never have thought the number was what it was. So if you had just taken those texts in the Bible where Jesus predicts that in three days he would... Now, don't look that up on your phone for me too quick. <laughs> I know these guys, they all got their phones. The preacher asks a question, and boom, they're there. they got it. 30 seconds, I'm five seconds later. Okay. How, how many times do you think it mentions in the Bible, in, in the Gospels, that in three days, if, G, if you destroy this body, I'll raise it up again? How many, somebody give me a number. Do you think it's five? Do you think it's eight? I think it's 14. 20. You are, how many? 21. You, 21, you looked it up, I know. <laughs> Who said 20, though? You, you were really close. 20. It was 21 times. 21 times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus says, if you destroy this body, I'll raise it up. Now, let's look at the Gospel of Mark. Why are we looking at Mark? Mark is the earliest of the Gospels, okay? Mark is written probably in about 70 AD. If Christ is crucified in 31, this is only, um, this, this is only a few years after the resurrection. See, it's only a few years old, less than, less than uh, 40 years after. And so we're going to look here at Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And the point that we are looking at is this, that the resurrection of Christ demonstrates beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ is divine. And if Christ is divine, his offer of eternal life is real. And that makes all the difference for you and me. Mark chapter 8, we're looking at verse 31 to 33. Mark 8, 31 to 33. And he began to teach them, Mark the gospel says, that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Next verse, he spoke this word openly. Now look, Jesus Christ predicted his death and resurrection. Can you think of any person in history, in the long history of the human race, that ever could predict their death and their resurrection? Now look at Mark chapter 9, verse 30 to 32. Mark 9, 30 to 32. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he didn't want anybody to know it. Verse 31, 
For he taught his disciples and said to them, the Son of Man is being delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after he's killed, he'll rise the third day. They didn't understand the saying, and they were afraid to ask it. Again, Jesus in Mark 8 predicts his death and resurrection. In Mark 9, he predicts his death and resurrection. Let's go to Mark 10. Mark 10, 32 to 34. Mark 10, verse 32 to 34. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jesus was going before them. They were amazed, and they followed, and they were afraid. Then he took the twelve aside and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, verse 33, Mark 10, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and to the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day he'll rise again. Notice, he predicts that he would be delivered to the chief priests. He predicts that he would die. He predicts that they would mock him. He predicts they would scourge him. He predicts they would spit on him. He predicts they would kill him. And he predicts the third day he would rise again. Think of the precision of his predictions. Somebody said, some skeptic says, some wise guy says, oh yeah, but, but, uh, but, uh, he, he, he kind of offered himself, you know, to be crucified. I mean, how can you predict that someone's going to spit on you? It's just illogical. How, how, how can you predict what they are going to say, that they're going to mock you if you're the Christ come down from the cross? How, how, how can you predict this minute, specific details? What is the eternal significance of the resurrection? First, the eternal significance of the resurrection is this, that Christ is alive. The tomb is empty. He is the divine Son of God. And his offer of eternal life to you is real. And if you turn your back on it, you're eternally lost. There is no other way of salvation. The resurrection of Christ demonstrates without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is the living Messiah. And if he indeed can conquer the grave, you and I who live this fragile, feeble life that James says is a vapor, we appear in the history of the world for a short period of time. It may be 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, but in the big scheme of things, we are here, and we live, and we die, and we're gone. It is hopeless without Christ. But in the light of the resurrection of the living Christ, life is meaning, life is purpose. Because if we die before he comes, it is but a rest. And the Christ that conquered the two, the Christ that burst the bonds of the grave, this living Christ offers to us eternal life and we can live again. Amen. Now the second thing in the great controversy between good and evil that the eternal significance of the resurrection demonstrates is this. Not only does it demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Son of God, the resurrection guarantees that Satan is a defeated foe. When Christ was resurrected, Satan knew that he was defeated. Christ's resurrection spelled the death knell to Satan and all the evil forces. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Here is the incredible good news. When Christ died, he defeated the principalities and powers of hell. When he rose from the grave, the final nail was driven in Satan's coffin. Notice what the scripture says. Can you, can you read it with me from the screen here? Let's read it together. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Every single one of us know 
when we read the obituary column in the newspaper. And the older you get, the more people you know in that obituary column. Every single one of us know that there is no exit from life except the exit of death. And so many people who don't know Christ, all of their present life, they have fear of death and they're subject to bondage. But here's the good news. Christ shared in death that through death and his resurrection, I add, he might destroy him who had power of death. How did Christ destroy him who had power of death? It's to, we find it in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. John tells us exactly how Christ destroyed the power of death. He destroyed it in his death on the cross, and he destroyed it in his resurrected life. Revelation chapter 1. How does Christ destroy the power of death? Revelation 1, verse 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is what, uh, what uh, John does when he falls before this being of dazzling brightness who indeed is the living Christ. But he laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of hell and death. Jesus said, I'm the one who lives and was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. So in the context of the great controversy between good and evil, we discover two things about the resurrection. First, that because of Christ's resurrection, he stands head and shoulders above any human being that ever lived. The resurrection, along with his life, confirms, validates, and authenticates that he's the divine Son of God and that his offer of eternal life is real. The resurrection, secondly, confirms, authenticates, and validates that Satan is a defeated foe that if Satan could not keep Christ in the grave, he cannot keep you in the grave or me in the grave. Now, how does this resurrection relate to our personal lives? What can an understanding of the resurrection do for you and for me during our journey on life? First, the resurrection assures us that Christ is alive today and that his resurrection power is available to us. Take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8, verse 11. The resurrection of Christ indicates that just as Christ came out of the grave and was resurrected from death, to new life so that we in our lives can experience new life in Christ. That the bondage of sin no, no longer needs to hold us. That the chains of sin no longer need to bind us. That the prison house of sin no longer needs to shackle us. Romans chapter 8 verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Now, it's kind of interesting because you're going to read some texts that say God raised him from the dead. You're going to read some texts where Jesus says, if I lay down my life, I will raise myself from the dead. And you read some texts that says the spirit raised him from the dead. Who raised him? The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit all together raised him. Um, but this says, if the Verse 11, the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So because the spirit of God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, that same Holy Spirit can live in me and take the deadness of my spiritual life and make it vibrant. That same Holy Spirit can live in me and give me Victory over the sins that shackle me and hold me down. The same spirit that rolled away the stone, the angel rolled away, but, but through the power 
of the living God, the same power of the living God that rolled away the stone, that same power is available to you and me. What does the resurrection of Christ mean to you and to me on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? It means that Christ is interceding for us in the heavenly sanctuary, and as we seek him, he will send his spirit into our lives to transform our lives. Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. The resurrection of Christ guarantees that through his resurrected life and his ministry in the sanctuary above, that all the power of Christ is ours. We need not live in frustrated defeat. We are not following some philosophical, historical leader. It's not that we look to somebody like, say, Mother Teresa, and we say, oh, I want to emulate her because of her kindness. It's not that we look to some earthly leader like an Abraham Lincoln and say, oh, uh, he, he, he did such good for the country. I wish I was like him. It's not that we look at some human ideal and try to be like them. It's rather that we open our heart to the resurrected Christ. And the resurrected Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, comes into our life and makes a miraculous change in us that we could never make in ourselves. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Paul talks about prayer, and he says, he talks about the exceeding greatness of his power. The, the, the what of Christ's power? What is it of Christ's power? What do we call it? The what? Exceeding what? Somebody got it. What is it? Exceeding greatness of his power. Do you believe that Christ's power is exceeding great? Do you believe that? You're not sure. Do you believe that Christ's power is exceeding great? Do you believe Christ's exceeding great power is greater than your failures? Do you believe it's greater than your weakness? Do you believe it's greater than your sin? Then why don't you grasp it? See, if we really believe that, we say, Christ, you were resurrected from the dead. You came out of the tomb. You are interceding for me as the living Christ above. And Jesus, by faith, I want to grasp the exceeding greatness of your power. We continue with our text. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places? The exceeding greatness of Christ's power is now resident in the living Christ who intercedes for us and the same power that raised Christ from the dead can be manifest in our lives. I love what it says in this little book that I might know him, page 71. If you don't have that book, it's a daily devotional book that you can read inspirational statements every single day. And it's a little book called That I Might Know Him that I found a blessing in my life, page 71. It says, Christ became one with humanity that humanity might become one in spirit and life with him. By virtue of this obedience, of this union, in obedience to the word of God, his life becomes their life. He says to the penitent, I'm the resurrection and the life. As we saturate our mind with the word of God, the same spirit that inspired the word, the same Holy Spirit that resurrected Christ from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that he pours out upon us today, that same Holy Spirit transforms our life and leads us closer to him. Not long ago, I was reading the story of George Mueller. And uh, George Mueller read the Bible through 200 times. The last time that George Mueller read the Bible through, he read it through the last 100 times. He read it through 100 times on his knees. As he read the Bible through, he sensed that the resurrected Christ had power to meet all his needs. And he developed this deep abiding faith in Christ, where Christ was a reality in his life, that Christ was living in his life. He supported over 120,000 orphans, never asked people one penny for money. And George Mueller one day was, came down to the little cafeteria where he had 300 orphans that were to eat. And his 
one of his uh, ladies there who was serving the food said, Brother George, we have nothing to eat for the children today. We've, as staff, we've given all of our money away to, to help buy food. We don't have any money at all for, for food today. And he said, let's have the, let's say grace. Let's thank God. He's going to supply it. He is the living Christ. He's resurrected. He sees these children are hungry. He, he knows he can feed them. So George Mueller prayed, dear Lord, we thank you that you're going to provide every child with something to eat today. And Lord, I'm asking for bread for every child. He finished praying, and there was a knock on the door. And a baker came, and the baker said to him, all last night I couldn't sleep. I was baking bread in my bakery, and I, I, I couldn't sleep all night. And I got up this morning, and I had this deep conviction that I had to come to this orphanage to give you bread. And George Mueller said, as I read the word of God, the resurrected Christ assured me that he would take care of me and my children. But that was not the end of the story. They distributed the bread to the children. Another knock came on the door. The milkman. He said, I can't explain it. But my cart, my milk cart delivering milk broke down. If that milk stays in the hot sun all day, it's going to spoil. Do you need any milk? Can I give it to your children? And they distributed the milk. The resurrection of Christ guarantees us that Christ is alive. What needs will you have this week? The living Christ knows your name. The living Christ will speak to your heart. There's a second thing. The resurrection of Christ guarantees us that Jesus has power over death. Here is a wonderful statement in another devotional book called The Upward Look, page 78. Should the earthly body decay, the principles of their faith sustain them, for they are partakers of the divine nature. Because Christ was raised from the dead, they grasp the pledge of their resurrection and eternal life as their reward. Remember when Paul dies, he says he's just about ready to die. He's an old man now. The, his hair is gray. There are deeply etched lines upon his face. His hand is shaking with trembling pen. And the apostle Paul writes, I have fought a good fight. I've finished the course. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness that the Lord will give me on that day, not only to me, but all those that love his appearing. Do you love the appearing of Jesus? Are you looking forward to the appearing of Jesus? Here the Apostle Paul says to you and to me, Christ is risen. The grave is defeated. Death is conquered. You can look forward to the resurrection when you lay that father or mother in the grave because of the cancerous death that they've experienced. You can know that you can see them again. When that child dies unexpectedly, you can know that death is conquered. You can know that the grave is defeated. What does the resurrection do for you and me in real life? It puts a spring in our step. It puts a smile on our face. It puts joy in our heart because we know that this life is not all there is. We know that Satan is defeated. We know that death is conquered. Paul points out that the resurrection of Christ assures us of the second coming of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He comes to the end of that magnificent chapter on the resurrection. And did you notice how Paul links the resurrection of Christ with the second coming of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we look there at verse 51 to 54. And Paul's arguing that Christ has conquered the tomb so we can be victorious. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we'll be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we'll be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, this mortal is put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where's your sting? O Hades, where's your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, what is the therefore, therefore? Therefore, therefore, because Christ is risen, because the resurrected Christ is coming again, therefore, my beloved brethren and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain for the Lord. Paul says, be unmoved. Trials, yes. Difficulties, yes. Challenges, yes. Heartaches, yes. Troubles, yes. There will be mountains to climb. There will be dark valleys to go through. But go through them with a spring in your step. Go through them with a smile on your face. Go through them with joy in your heart. Christ is risen. Christ has risen. Christ has risen. And this risen Christ is coming again. One day the earth will shake. Lightning will flash. One day the dead will be resurrected. One day Jesus will come. We are headed not for the grave, but we're headed for glory land. Christ is risen. You know, that song, The Lord is Risen Today, was written by Charles Wesley. Now, Charles Wesley's parents, Samuel and Susanna Wesley, had 18 children. Did you know that? 18 children, same mother, same father. When Charles was born, he was born prematurely. They thought, no chance for this young man to live. He's going to die. In fact, they pronounced him dead at birth. But then somebody saw there was a little breath in Charles Wesley. Somebody saw his, his little fingers are moving. His little toes are moving. Maybe, maybe he's not dead at all. And God raised him up as a little premature baby. And you know how many hymns he wrote? He couldn't even remember half the hymns he wrote. 6,500. That's on the low end. Some people say he wrote over 8,000. 6,500 hymns. He came to an Easter weekend and he wrote a hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. Christ is risen, death is conquered. Christ is risen, the stone is rolled away. Christ is risen, interceding for us, his spirit is ours. We need not live in frustrated defeat. Christ is risen. There is hope that Jesus is coming again. Let's sing about it. <laughs>